Now we're back to the slides. So my name is Bruce Schaefer. Uh, I've been involved with FIRST programs, including FIRST LEGO League for over two decades. I'm getting old, you can tell by the gray. Um, and I've been involved with Spike Prime programming since about 2020 when it was fairly new. Um, so I know a fair amount about it, but uh, just in the last couple of weeks, I've learned more, um, partly from seeing some stuff on the internet and partly from teaching, you always learn something from teaching. Um, so as I was saying earlier, I'm going to cover some slides and then I'm going to transition into using the Spike Prime app uh, to show you how it's how it's programmed. Um, if we were all, all together in a classroom with lots of computers and lots of robots, I would be having you do the things I'm going to show you so that you would get hands on. Uh, this will be instead of more of a show and tell, but I think it'll be a lot better than all slides. So we'll start with slides, but we'll go into show and tell mode. Sometimes the show and tell will be uh, programming on the screen using the graphical language uh, that Spike Prime has called word blocks. And sometimes it'll be seeing what the robot does. I, you can see that there's uh, somebody logged in under the name Bruce's webcam. That's me on a separate computer with a webcam. You can see that's pointing at a map, which I'll explain later. I can also have a way of making that bigger so it's easier for you to see. This is my contact information. If you have questions for me as your instructor, uh, you can even call me if you like. Um, and if you have questions that are not very specific to what I'm teaching, please use registrar at ortop.org. That will automatically be routed to the person that is most likely to have the answer to your question. We certainly welcome questions. With me tonight is Bobby Kelly, our program manager. Um, so she'll be handling some questions by chat tonight. Don't feel like you have to put all your questions in chat. Any question you think uh, I might be able to answer, uh, it'll be a lot easier if you just shout it out. It makes it more interesting for me. If you've got the question, probably six other people do too. Um, and let's see. So we're, we're gonna do some introduction to the material. We're gonna cover motors and movement today. We probably will, won't cover sensors significantly until next time, although we will probably cover the gyro tonight. Um, and in process of demonstrating the gyro, we'll do what's called control flow. Uh, we won't cover variables display, my blocks or sound tonight. We'll cover more sensors next uh, time and I'll have more to say about the next session before we wrap up tonight. Um, when I taught this a couple of weeks ago, I was able to hold it to almost exactly an hour and a half. So you should be free to go uh, right at eight o'clock. I may stay a few extra minutes, but um, don't feel like you need to stay past eight. I respect your evening and your commitment to learning tonight, but not indefinitely. This is your evening. Um, so while I'm talking, I'd like you to type this information in. Uh, if you're uncomfortable with any of it, just skip it. Uh, I'm, uh, I'd appreciate knowing who's here because I can't see everything uh, from the screen I'm presenting from. I, I know I have four names in front of me, but most of you I can't see. Um, curious about where you are from. Uh, most of you I would expect are here in Oregon, but some may be from another state. That'd be fun to find out. If you're affiliated with a school, then the name of the school would be of interest. Uh, if you're not affiliated with the school, just skip that. If you're a teacher, you can use the word teacher. If you're a parent and not a teacher, um, say parent. Uh, I know a lot of teachers are parents, but if your reason for being here tonight is teacher, say that instead of parent. And if neither of those categories fit, you might give us a hint as to which category does fit. If you've previously been involved in uh, First Lego League uh, in any significant capacity, please say new, or say returning. If you have not yet coached a team, um, you might know something about it, but haven't actually coached, uh, say new, and uh, that'll help us understand uh, where you're coming from. Um, then I'm also interested in how you heard about the workshop. We publicize this in several different ways. Some of you received an email probably from Bobby Kelly, who I said is on tonight. Uh, some of you 
uh, may have seen an email forwarded from your principal. I sent an email out to quite a few principals uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, or you may be a parent that got an email from a teacher, or you maybe you just web searched and found us on the web. Uh, these classes are posted on ortop.org uh, under education workshops. And if these four categories don't fit, give us a hint as to how you did find us. We're curious because um, that helps us communicate better and more effectively in the future. Uh, so hopefully you kind of captured that because I'm going to go to the next slide. So we want to prepare you to be a coach uh, uh, where you're um, coaching a team that's using Spike Prime. If you have access to EB3 kits instead, the programming language for that is almost identical, completely different name. It's, instead of calling it Spike Prime word blocks, it's called EB3 Classroom. Both are based on Scratch. Um, so almost everything we covered tonight will be applicable, but some of the details will be different because the kits are different. Uh, we're not gonna teach you everything you possibly need to know, partly because of the limitation of time, partly because it takes a while to absorb all this stuff, and mostly because you really don't have to know all this stuff, the kids figure it out. But uh, you'll have a greater comfort level if you can at least know what questions to ask. We recommend that you do not give uh, the students how to solve it, ask them questions, encourage them to experiment, expect them to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. The kids do the work. Um, Scratch is an educational language. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was invented at MIT based on some research that preceded it. Uh, as we'll see, it's very graphical. You don't have to remember a whole bunch of keywords because they're all in the menus. Uh, you plug things together. If they won't plug together, it's because they're not meant to be together. So it's hard to make what uh, computer scientists call syntax mistakes because uh, if it's bad syntax, it won't plug in. You can still make lots of mistakes because the robot will always do what you told it to do, not what you meant it to do. Every so often, what you told it to do will be what you meant it to do and it'll behave accordingly. When it doesn't, that's called a bug and it's a learning opportunity. The standard version of Scratch uh, was built in the cloud, so you could access it from any uh, web browser and uh, build programs in the cloud that do interesting things. Um, there is a version of, of WordBox that operates in the cloud. You're free to use that, um, but a cautionary note, um, when you go to a tournament, um, if you take a laptop along that you've previously been accessing Word blocks in the cloud, you may not have reliable Wi-Fi internet access at a tournament. And the kids will probably want to make last minute changes and they're going to be very frustrated if you can't access the cloud. So instead, I encourage you either at the beginning or early in the season to install uh, the uh, Word blocks application, and the, the full spike uh, application on a laptop or a pad or a Chromebook, it operates in about five different uh, uh, technologies. And that way, when you go to a tournament, you'll be used to using it in that mode. And you, while you can't take the computer or the pad to the competition table, it can be used at what we call the pit at a tournament, um, which is a table allocated to your team for the tournament to get ready for the rounds. Uh, any questions about the, that distinction of between the cloud and installing and computers and all of that? I'll take a breath and take questions. Okay, shout out if you have a question. Um, so I already mentioned that tonight we're focusing on word blocks for Spike Prime, Scratch Base. Uh, the sister uh, that's retroactively available for the Mindstorm TV3 is called EB3 Classroom. Um, about 85% the same, uh, where the differences have to do with the differences in uh, what, how, how you plug things in, uh, exactly the details of the motors, what, how, uh, what the sensors are called are a bit different in the two kits. So the word blocks are a bit different uh, to match the, the hardware, so to speak. Um, once, if you do the install that I'm recommending, you internet is not uh, necessary after that, unless you want to update to a more recent version. Um, 
if you're connected to the internet, when you bring it up uh, in a session, it may offer to uh, update you at the, on the spot. It's okay to go ahead and do that, but about nine out of 10 times when it updates um, the app on your computer, the next time you connect to the hub, the, the big brick uh, on the robot, it will offer to download what it calls firmware to the robot that matches your new app. Uh, it should only have to do that once. A little cautionary note, coaches have told me that if they have the luxury of having two different computers or a pad and a computer, if the two of them have different versions of the app, it will be constantly offering to download new firmware each time you switch from one to the other because it wants to make sure that the firmware on the little robot matches the app and that can waste a lot of time. So either make sure that all the computers are using the same version of the app or just use one computer, which is a lot simpler. Uh, in addition to what we're covering tonight, there are a variety of resources on the ORTOP wiki. Uh, some of that uh, the content on our wiki has been created here in Oregon, uh, and some uh, we have so-called curated by finding it elsewhere on the web and linking it to the wiki so that it makes it easier for you to find those national and maybe even international resources. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel that has quite a few, few uh, resources. Um, and um, typically the uh, Lego comes out with what's called a guided mission. If you follow the link on the screen, it will uh, lead you to the guided mission uh, for the previous season a year ago. Uh, what is a guided mission? On the FLL table, there are over a dozen different missions that the robot can do. And generally speaking, it's up to the kids to write their own program for each mission, or maybe a one program for several missions. But each year, not right about quite so early, but right around August, September, somebody at LEGO writes either a, a solution for one of the missions or more likely just a partial solution that can be uh, serve as kind of a getting started for your team once that becomes available. But again, the, if you if you were to follow this link, you would get a guided mission for uh, the uh, last season's table, which you can use during the summer. But uh, once the uh, details are announced on August 6, you'll want to be using uh, the, the, the latest missions on the la latest mat and, and wait for the guided mission to come out from LEGO. That should show up right in the app. When you update the app, suddenly there'll be uh, a guided mission in the app, but if it's not, you should be able to find it on the web. Um, so a, a few somewhat esoteric computer science concepts. I've already mentioned that programming is very literal. Um, if uh, the motors for the wheels are connected to A and B, and you tell the robot they're connected to C and D, it will believe you. And you tell it to go, nothing will happen because it's trying to provide uh, the voltage to C and D connectors and the motors are connected to A and B, it, uh, it'll do what you told it and nothing will happen. Likewise, if you connect a light sensor to port uh, B and you tell it to read the light sensor in A, it will read, try to read the light sensor in A even if it doesn't exist. So there's lots of potential uh, mistakes that if you were talking to a human, it would probably guess what you really meant. Robots don't do that job very well. Maybe someday there'll be a little Lego brick that's artificially intelligent. This one is a smart brick, but it's not artificially intelligent. It takes everything very literally. Another concept is, uh, while there's a few programming languages in the world that uh, you program from left to right, um, the uh, typical programming pro professional languages are top to bottom. While Scratch doesn't look like a professional language, it is top to bottom. So when the kids construct these programs from top to bottom, they will be reflecting the same concepts that they may someday either as middle school students or high school students or college students, or uh, maybe in the professional world, uh, they might be using a language like Python or Java or many of the other languages. Almost all of them are top to bottom like Spike Prime Professional languages are typically not as graphical as the one we'll be using tonight. Here's an example of some of those graphics. Um, if you were using a professional language, you would probably type in 
repeat until uh, A equals seven or, or greater than seven or something like that. And then you would listen to things that should be repeated. In this language, you, you drag and drop a, a block that looks vaguely like a Lego block onto the screen from a menu on the left. And then you plug things into that block. Uh, loops are a very common computer science concept. In Spike Prime, sometimes they're explicit. Repeat until with, uh, with something in the middle, uh, you're looping what you plug into the middle. Uh, there are also some things that they create loops for you. To use a fancy term, I'll call those implicit loops because when you say wait until something, you're basically saying repeat until and don't bother to do anything while you're repeating. So I'll, instead of calling that repeat, I'll call it wait. The robot may be doing something because you previously gave it something to do. It'll keep doing that, but the program will wait until a certain condition will occur. What's a condition? We'll touch on that tonight and get farther into that next week. Another implicit one that we will use tonight is move forward for 10 rotations or for five inches or for 12 centimeters. What that's actually doing behind the scenes is says, uh, internally it says, start moving forward. And now uh, 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 watch the wheels move using a built-in sensor. And when you see them moving enough rotations or partial rotations, so you reach a certain distance, then stop that loop. So uh, a fairly uh, multi-step process is all built into this one pink block. And as you'll see, the pink blocks will be my favorites tonight. They are the ways to get the robot moving around the playing field. There's also blue blocks, which we'll touch on, which can be used for any motor. But if you're using a pair of motors to drive the robot, the pink block blocks are almost always the right solution. We'll, we'll see examples of that. So I'm just kind of preparing you with the lay of the land and we'll get more concrete in a moment. Any questions about programming concepts, including loops, um, before we go on to uh, the next concrete level of concreteness? Uh, if you joined us uh, in the last few minutes, uh, you may notice in chat that people have uh, provided some hints about who they are, where they're from, where they heard about uh, tonight's uh, workshop. All of that is really useful information to Bobby and myself, uh, both to know who's here tonight, who we hope will be here a week from now, and uh, also how we can better uh, publicize these workshops so more people can benefit. Uh, in a little while, we're going to uh, fire up the uh, Spike Prime uh, environment. And uh, after clicking on new project, it'll say, do we want word blocks or Python? Tonight, we'll, we'll always say word blocks. Python is available. I don't recommend it for a new a beginning team. Uh, a second year team might want to consider it, especially if they have a coach or mentor that knows something about Python. But word blocks is plenty powerful enough to be very competitive in first leg, Lego League. So don't feel like the kids have to jump into Python anytime soon unless they're really uh, getting bored with word blocks. Uh, there's another place where you can click on new, new project. When we get into the show and tell, you'll see that. This is an example from EV3 Classroom. So you can see it's very similar to what I showed you on the previous screen. Um, so I'll repeat myself here. Uh, use the blue uh, motor uh, blocks to control single motors, uh, to do things like uh, lifting, pushing, pulling, dropping, uh, but use the pink movement blocks to drive the robot around the field. And you'll see those on screen in a, in a bit. Uh, the, the top of the brick, I think I can grab, grab one to show you. Oh, you right back. I plugged it in uh, to make it sure it was fully charged and I left it there. So I think you can see it if I hold it up. This is the big, the hub brick. And if you kind of squint, you'll see A, B, C, D, E, F. Um, when you first get this out of the kit, it'll be almost impossible to read those letters because 
they're embossed white on white. What I've done is I've taken a pencil or a felt tip pen and darkened them up so you can almost see them on the screen there. Uh, what those are labeling is connectors on the side. This is the A connector, the B connector, the C connector, et cetera. On this robot, I've got the motors that drive these wheels connected to C and D. Um, and I've got sensors connected A and B. And I've got another motor connected to E. And I currently do not have anything connected to F. So I could add another motor to F or I could add a, another sensor to F. The maximum number to oversimplify for a bit is six of any combination of sensors and motors. You can't connect more than six things to this hub, but six should be plenty, especially because you get one free sensor built into this um, hub is what we call a gyro sensor that does not need to be connected because it's built in. And that'll be the sensor that we'll probably use tonight and we'll use the external sensors next time. Any questions about this brick and the A through F and the cables and et cetera? Any questions in chat, Bami, that I need answering? No, no questions. Okay. Okay, we'll be we'll be using this robot extensively tonight. Um, so I just showed you the top of the brick, um, A through F, but here's a pink block that when you click on uh, this part of the block, it gives you this nice graphical image and says, where have you plugged in these motors? You're gonna be using this, another pink block to, to drive around, but you need to tell me where you plugged in your motors. And here we would have selected C and D, which happens to match the robot I'm holding, but I could have easily cabled the, those motors to A and B, in which case I better tell the program that they're connected A and B. Another block that we'll be featuring in a little while is it's always wise to tell it how uh, big the wheels are. The, the standard wheels that come with the basic kit happen to be 17 and a half centimeters in circumference. We tell the program that by saying set one motor rotation to equal 17 and a half centimeters move because each time the wheel goes fully around, it will drive the robot forward by uh, the same number of centimeters as the wheel circumference. Um, the block that's on the screen will probably already have 17 and a half centimeters filled in. So you can just use that. But if you see some other number, uh, then you're gonna wanna change it. Unless you have the expansion set, which has optional bigger wheels, which you need to look that up. And I think they're 26 centimeters in circumference instead of 17 and a half. And if you're using those wheels, you need to tell the program because otherwise it will calculate distance, assuming 17 and a half, which won't work out too well. You also should explicitly, and that is when I say you, I mean the kids on your team, should explicitly set the motor speed. That's set in a, as a percentage. This block typically comes out of the uh, menu tray at 50%. I recommend initially setting it to 20 or 25%. Um, if something goes wrong, it's a lot easier to see if the robot's moving slower. Uh, if you set this too high, not only may the kids have trouble seeing what happened before it went astray, but the robot might skid and slide or, or not see something because you're go it's going too fast. A lot easier to start a program slow, perfect it, and then change this block in one place make the robot go faster and see if it still reliably does the same thing, only takes less time because it's going faster. We'll, we'll see examples of that tonight as well. So here's an example where those three blocks have been plugged in, uh, followed by a block that says move forward for 10 centimeters. Notice that we could select rotations of the wheel. Degrees does not, uh, mean what you might guess. We'll, we'll get more in degrees later because this the whole idea of degrees has got two meanings that are easily uh, mixed up. But in this case, what it means is partial rotations of uh, the axle. So as an adult, you probably recall that a one full rotation of uh, the compass is 360 degrees. And you can also measure, um, you, you can, measure uh, 
rotations or circles is 360 degrees around. So that's what's meant by degrees here. So if you said 1.5 rotations in this block, uh, that would be synonymous with saying 180 degrees. If you said 0.25 rotations, that of course would be 90 degrees. If you said seconds, it's anybody's guess how many degrees or inches that is. It'll be however far it gets in, in a certain number of seconds. That is convenient, but highly unreliable because it may go uh, farther when a fully charged battery is, told, uh, is driving the motors for two seconds versus uh, an hour later when the batteries are not quite so fully charged. It may not go as far in two seconds. Likewise, if it does a, um, uh, a little imprecision in the way it accelerates, seconds is uh, going to be less reliable than giving rotations or degrees and even better centimeters or inches. Uh, fourth and fifth graders, I expect you're probably going to want to use inches. But if you have any reason to believe the kids know centimeters, that's perhaps even better, particularly at the middle school level, if they've learned that. Or maybe you'll be the one that teaches them a metric system and they'll go back to class uh, a step ahead. Questions about any of these blocks? Oh, Bruce, I have a question. Please. Uh, if we say for the last statement, we specify... 17.5 centimeter. Do we still need the second statement? Um, which second statement? <clears throat> oh, the second statement, set one mode of rotation to 17.5. Oh, that, no, that is the statement. When I talk about this block, I talk about the circumference. <clears throat> but if you actually look at the block, it doesn't even use the word circumference. It just implies it. One, it but when you say set one mode of rotation to 17.5, centimeters, that's informal talk for, I'm hereby informing you my wheels are 17 and a half centimeters in circumference. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just I... a, an oblique way of, of telling it the circumference of the wheel. Oh, okay. But for the the fourth statement, when you, if I change that to 17.5 centimeter? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I see. Oh, I, could, I, could, I, could I get away to the second statement? No. No, okay. I, I see what your distinction is. The uh, the second <clears throat> block, you, you will, I would probably only give once in the entire program. And that says, for now on, uh, trust me, my wheels are 17 and a half centimeters in circumference. The mm -hmm. fourth block says, I would, when you reach this block, I want you to start driving that motor forward, uh, start driving that robot forward. And I want you to keep going until you've calculated that the wheels have turned enough times to move the robot forward 17 and a half uh, to 10 centimeters. So if you mm -hmm. kind of do the math in your head just very roughly, um, that's about two thirds of a rotation. And you can teach the kids how to uh, take the desired distance um, and um, uh, divide by the number of rotations times pi or I've, I'd have to recalculate that formula, but mm -hmm. the robot is smart enough to do that um, conversion of distance to rotations using pi, uh, because you've told it the circumference, it saves the kids from having to learn that particular math formula, because you can then, and in fact, even though you told it the circumference in centimeters, it's even smart enough to say, if you say go five inches, it makes the conversion from metric to, to English, and figures out how many rotations to go to get that number of inches. So it's a really easy way for fourth graders to program a robot. In the original generation of uh, Lego robots, you always had to tell it how many rotations and the kids had to, had to figure out how the distance related to circumference. And that's a, a useful math skill, but uh, pretty, pretty abstract for fourth graders. Gotcha. So you'll see, you'll see that in practice when I, I do the show and tell. Um, here's another example. Uh, instead of telling it to go a certain number of inches, I'm telling it to go a half a rotation. Uh, but that's going to be uh, nine and a quarter centimeters, I think, right? A half of a circumference will be nine and a quarter centimeters. So this is a, a very indirect way of saying I want to go uh, half, half, uh, half of this circumference. So I say I can say it in rotations. Uh, I recommend, when in doubt, 
specify in centimeters or inches, it'll be a lot easier. Um, on the other hand, um, this is not saying go straight forward. Uh, it's saying uh, make a hard right turn. And by really weird coincidence, if you tell it with this particular size robot and this particular distance between the wheels and this particular circumference of the wheels, telling it to make a, a hard right, and we'll, I'll define what I mean by that in, in a moment, a, a turn in place to the right. And if you hap it, it happens that a half a rotation of the wheels will not turn it halfway around, it'll turn it quarter way around because the half of the rotation is not the turning of the robot, it's the turning of the wheels. And it's just a weird coincidence that half a rotation of the wheels for this particular robot will give you almost exactly, but not quite, a 90 degree turn of the robot. And that will make more sense when I show it on the actual playing field, but uh, you'll see that in action. Um, here's the same program, will produce exactly the same results, except in saying, instead of saying a half a rotation, we said 180 degrees, which is just another way of saying half a rotation. What is the 100 in the right colon 100? That is a, a really a percentage. And that is a really good segue for me to get out of PowerPoint mode and show you right in the program. Any other questions on the slides before I launch right into the program and we see it actually work instead of talking about it? Okay, so let me jump into that. I'm going to stop that share. And on my screen, I'm going to make sure that I have Spike program loaded. There he is. Okay, and then I'm going to go back to Zoom. and share the spike program. Okay. So the program supports both the, the younger simpler kit called Spike Essential, which is uh, typically used by First Lego League Explorer, second through fourth grade, overlapping by one year with First Lego League Challenge, fourth through eighth. Uh, we're focusing on, on Spike Prime, uh, but many of the principles tonight apply in a simpler way to Spike Essential. This is the real program. This is not a screenshot. You can see it even animated. I'm going to click on Spike Prime. Uh, now we, we can say start, uh, but that will give you some really useful intro information that you're going to want to do when you install this program for the first time. But I'm going to cheat, and I'm going to say I want to create a new project. So I click right here. Now it says, wait a minute. Do you want icon blocks, word blocks, or Python? I recommend word blocks if uh, for fourth graders because they, they, I think almost all the words on the word blocks uh, will be within their reading ability. If you happen to have uh, Spanish speaking kids, I'm pretty sure you can tell Spike Prime to use Spanish words instead of English words. Um, if you're not sure of the reading ability of kids, you could use icon blocks. I don't have any experience, but they're basically they get rid of the words and replace them with little pictures. Uh, Python is a more traditional, semi-professional language. So I'm going to select word box and create. OK, now gives you me menus. Uh, it gives me my first block that says, when program starts. This basically says, anything I connect to this block, I want uh, to uh, happen as soon as I start the program. And I'll show you how to start the program in a bit. First, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger to make it maybe a tad easier to see on your screen. This is the plus sign down here. If I have too many blocks uh, on the screen, I can always shrink it down with the minus sign. Um, there's also a, an undo thing down here. So a lot of convenient features. Um, so, so far, I haven't actually given it anything to do. I could use these blue blocks, but I, I don't recommend it for driving the robot tonight. Driving a robot is our theme. So here's those blocks I was talking about. Uh, you can put these in in any order. I'm going to plug this one in, but my robot is using C and D. So I'm going to tell it that my wheels are connect, wheel motors are connected to C and D. 
and then I'm going to tell it my uh, wheel circumference is 17 and a half. Uh, and that's a promise I'm making it because I know the size of my wheels. Um, then I'm going to tell it that until further notice, I want you to operate not at 50% speed, but at 25% speed. I click on this. I could have also uh, changed this to some other number, but that would not match the wheels, so I didn't change it. So now I have a program that tells the app three things, but has not actually told the robot to do anything yet. So I'm going to tell it to, to move forward. Here's that block we were looking at a, a minute ago, move forward. But I really don't like rotations that much, especially for moving straight forward. So I'm going to change that to inches. And I'll leave it at 10. I'm going to have this robot go 10 inches forward. And then I'm going to grab the same block again. And I'm going to say, I don't know why, but I want you to then back up five inches. Very simple, go forward 10, come back five. Now this robot, this program is not in the robot. I've got to get in the robot. I can use the USB cable that comes with the kit to do that. But after a few times that becomes inconvenient because typically the robot is not right next to your computer. Uh, it, you've left it where it was on the playing field. So um, I'm going to go ahead and set up a, uh, a Bluetooth connection for convenience and for demonstration. So up here, I need to tell it about that. So I click on connect. It wants to know whether my robot is displaying green or white on the big button. It's displaying neither because I haven't turned it on. So I will turn it on now. This particular technology boots really fast. It's faster than EV3 robot. And when it comes to, to booting up this little uh, brick that has a microprocessor inside, but you can see it's green. So that answers the question here. This means it's got relatively recent so-called firmware that will turn out to match the app that I'm running. If I told it white, it would want to upgrade before it went further. Now it says, oh, okay. So far, so good. You've got the green button, but now you need to push the button in the upper right hand corner, which is the Bluetooth button, blue for Bluetooth. Um, so I'm going to do that. So it says it found one robot in the vicinity. It's got some obscure uh, serial number, and I'm going to say connect. So it goes and tries to connect, and it's connected. It says hub was successfully connected, and I can say dismiss. So now I've got a green check, bar, check mark in the upper left-hand corner indicating it's connected. If that go, green check mark goes away, you have to reconnect. Um, now that I've got that, I have the option of putting the program on the screen into the robot. To do that, I go down to the bottom here, and I see that it's got what looks like a very square zero. And if I click on that, it gets bigger. Uh, you can have up to 20 programs in this robot. Um, on the EB3, you can give them names. For simplicity, uh, the Spike Prime gives them numbers. That's not quite as neat as giving them names, but in the pressure of selecting a program on the competition field, when you've only got two and a half minutes and you want to switch from one program to another, it's a lot easier to choose a number on this big display than a name on a tiny little display. Notice the robot doesn't have any numbers on it at all, but if I click on this download arrow, it will download it into slot zero. And then if I push this button, I'll make this bigger in a second, uh, it goes to zero and I can push this button. Let me drop the share to make me bigger, potentially. Uh, I need to spotlight myself, I guess. Yeah. Okay, there's that same robot. There's the zero nice and big. Now I'm going to push the green button and you see the wheels move. And then they're going to reverse direction. Well, I think they already did. Okay, let me do that again. Okay. So we don't know that it went 10 inches and five inches, but we will in a minute. I'm gonna drop the uh, that spotlight 
And I'm going to put a spotlight on my webcam, if I can find that. I'm going to put it down on the road here uh, so you can see it. Uh, this is a not a official competition map. This is a map that we designed with the CAD program a few years ago. If you're interested in this map, it's available on our wiki for download, and you can print it on any high format, high, uh, a large capacity printer. Uh, I had it done at a FedEx office. Probably could have done it at other other places, like I don't know, uh, uh, Staples maybe, um, or maybe uh, you have access to a school that has a, a, a large format printer. Uh, not that you're required to do that. That's just what you happen to be looking at tonight. A second here. So now we're going to put. Oh, oh I got it. All right. Got rid of the echo. Pardon me. Ten inches forward stops. Goes back five. Okay, so that's what those blocks do. That in that very simple program. Any questions about the program or what we just saw on the screen? All right, now I'm gonna get uh, next to answering the question about what does 100 mean on that other block? So I'm going to go back to sharing my app screen. There we go. And I'm gonna drag uh, this block out there. I just happen to know that this is how I would get that other one. Now, right, right now it says very cryptically, move right 30, that's 30%, which will be a little clearer as I demonstrate it. I'm gonna click on there and it gives me this very graphical rendition and 30%, uh, it explains as a gradual turn to the right. If I drag this arrow all the way as far as it will go, it says right 100. That is a convenient way of which we could say in a very much more complicated way. If I want to go right in place, so make the left wheel go forward and the back wheel go back. If you think about it, if you look at the wheel from the left side, that would mean to make it go forward would be going counterclockwise. Um, and the wheel on the right to go back would also be going counterclockwise and it'll turn in place. If I wanted to turn in place to the left, I crank it all the way to the other side. It would make the right wheel go forward, the left wheel go back. And it's not something you would see a car do, but this robot has only two wheels plus a roller on the bottom. I might as well show you that on the screen. I think you can see that. Uh, instead of four wheels, it's got this roller ball right there. So we can turn like uh, 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 certain types of tractors or forklifts uh, right in place. So I told it a left turn. Uh, it turns out that if I wanted to turn uh, a 90 degree turn, that's about the same as a half of a rotation of the wheels. Uh, not precisely true, we'll, we'll get to precision later, but if I remember correctly and my rule of thumb is correct, it will turn in place, rotate the one of the wheels forward and the other back by half rotation, having the effect of turning left 90 degrees. So we ne never said 90 degrees, but that just happens to be what we'll get approximately. If I told the robot to run right now, it would do the old program. I haven't put this program in, so I need to click here again. If I want, I can say, I don't want to put it in zero. I want to leave whatever's in zero and zero. I want to put it in slot one and download that into one. If I now stop my screen share, you can see the playing field again. If I run zero, it'll do what it did last time. If I stop that program and move it to one and then say start, it'll run the new program. It will go back and then it will turn in place to the left. You see, it's not exactly 90 degrees, but it's close. Does that help a little bit? Our follow up questions about 
that weird block that was on the screen? Yeah, it does. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So um, if we use just these kind of blocks and navigate on the around the uh, field, if we either take fairly good measurements and use our measurements to program the robot, or we get close by measuring and then we do some trial and error fine tuning, we'll be able to navigate on the, on the field pretty well. Uh, time permitting tonight, after we do this, what, what I just described as dead reckoning, uh, that's a kind of a nautical term for heading off into a certain direction and hoping that you get to the island you're looking for. Um, we will use the gyro to add some additional precision and then uh, we probably won't get to using sensors for precision until next time, uh, but that'll be a good reason to come back a week from now. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop the screen share and I'm going to take some measurements on the on the field. Uh, the tape measure I have is both metric and uh, English, uh, just in case you're, you've got kids that are, uh, I don't know, do they teach metric in eighth grade these days? I've lost track. I'm going to do use metric just for fun. The robot's here. I want its wheels to move it until the wheels are centered on that turn over there. Uh, so I'm going to lay my tape measure down and measure back to the wheels. And I see 26 centimeters, pretty close. No, 26 inches. 66 centimeters. Uh, can you see that on the screen there? That's about 66. Are you, are you the to the, Go uh, ahead. Sorry, uh, Bruce, are you measuring to the base of the um, hub where the green button is at the bottom? I could, but um, my, I've done some work on this before and I've discovered that if I'm gonna, down here, if I want it to turn in place, when it makes a turn, you want the wheels lined up with the new road, the left road. So the turn in place will line it up here. So I wanted to the wheels to be centered on this. So I measured to that point from where the wheels were back here. Got it. Thank you. There's other ways you could have gotten a similar measurement. That's happened to be the way I did it. Okay, so I need to tell the program that. Um so I'm going to go back to screen sharing. Keep those questions coming. It makes it more interesting for me. Um, so I'm going to change this one to, to 66. But it's not. If I left it as inches, it would do what I told it to, which would be way too far. I need to tell it what I meant it to do, which is 66 centimeters. I no longer wanted to go back. Uh, that was kind of pointless from the beginning, but it was an interesting demonstration. But I do still want it to make a, a, a fairly close 90 degree left turn. And we've discovered that turn in place, 100% left turn um, with a half a rotation of the wheels in opposite directions will tend to make it a left turn. And then I'm going to have it go forward, change this to forward, and I'll leave it at five inches for now because I haven't taken my next measurement, but we'll come back and do some measurements in a minute. Any questions about the change I've made here? Forward 66 centimeters, turn in place to the left, uh, half rotation should be about 90 degrees to the left, and move forward five inches. I'm going to put that uh, as a new version of program one by hitting the down arrow. And that's now in the program. So I'm going to uh, stop my share so you can see, get a bigger copy of what's on the playing field here. Uh, and I'm going to hit the green go button. Better make it look a little straighter to start with. Not bad. OK, 
Okay, so that, that's about what I wanted to do. To do. Uh, so a relatively careful measure worked out. I, I could do maybe get a little bit better, uh, especially if I, I decided exactly where the start point was, uh, that would be important. Um, actually, why don't we make this a bit more complicated? Um, the start of the road is actually over here. So I'm gonna line up that light sensor with that red dot on the road. I think you can still see that. Then I'm gonna add a couple more steps since we had some early success. So I'm gonna go back to share screen. And I need to insert steps. So I'm going to drag these blocks out of the way. I, I, I'm gonna reuse them in a second. I'm going to tell it to move forward a certain number of centimeters. Um, and I'm gonna use my tape measure. You may not, it's gonna be pretty small on your screen, but I'll make a quick measurement here. Uh, I'm getting 11 centimeters. Um, couldn't probably quite see that on, on the screen, if, but uh, I'm gonna use 11. And then I wanted to make a hard right to turn on the on the road. So I'm going to tell it to use this block again. And I'm going to crank it over to 100% turns for a turn in place to the right instead of a gradual 30% turn. And then I'm going to have it go to the 66, but I don't think the 66 is going to be quite right anymore. So let me drop the screen share and fix that. Uh, if it moves up to here, I'm going to move the house out of the way. Um, I think it's going to be more than 66 because that's farther back. So I'm going to remake them. Yep, I'm now getting 72. So I'm going to change the 66 step to 72 because we gave it farther to go. Um, and then I'm going to save this program in the robot. And I'm going to drop the screen share so you get a bigger version of the map. Push the green button again. Oh, oh. I got to start it where I said I was going to start it, right? Right there. Now, sir. Oh, that's pretty confusing. So that's a bug. Let's take a look at our program. I'm glad. Uh, it was totally my mistake, but. You can see that even though I've got a fair amount of experience, uh, I make mistakes as well. And that's a learning opportunity for all of us, I guess. So I need to go screen share again and go find my bug. Uh, all right, 100. Oh, I said 10 rotations. I never, I never updated this. I meant I should have said one half a rotation. So that's why I was rotating a lot, right? It did what I told it to do, not what I meant it to do. So I'm, trust me, that was not intentional. That was just, I was going too fast, not thinking carefully. So I just downloaded that again, dropped the start screen share, put it back in the start position, hit the green button. Start point is, uh... oh. Okay. Start, go ahead and ask that question. No, oh. I'm sorry. I thought the start point was not correct. So oh, I you were correct. I, uh, you you caught it before I did. So I, I'm putting it back. I think now the start uh, point is correct. Uh, a little bit to the left, I think. You should be pretty, pretty close now. Okay. Yeah, thanks for noticing that. Uh, I'm going to circle again. Okay, now the green button.
All right. So that's it's doing what, what I meant it to do because it's what I told it to do. Questions about what we've done so far? Okay, now I need to tell you a story. Um, it turns out, at least in my fantasy land for children, that this is a yellow cat. And this cat lives at this house. Um, should live right about there. But the cat behaves like a cat. And it went wandering, and it got lost, so it hid in this box. So our mission um, is to rescue the cat. And getting to that exact position is quite challenging, but we can get close. So we're going to run it again and see how close it is to the cat um, from starting at the beginning. Okay, that time didn't go quite as straight, but it got approximately the right location. But we never measured that distance to the, the house because I hadn't told you the story yet. So I'm going to move the robot. Put it back in the start position. So it was right there, right? Yep, right there. And now I'm going to get my tape measure out again. And I'm going to measure this distance from this corner to the front of the house where the cat is. And uh, for consistency, I'm going to use centimeters. I'm getting 16. And a little more like 15 and a half. I'll call it 15 and a half, see what I get. So I'm going to go back to the program. Move it up a little bit. And I'm going to add, I'm going to change this from random five inches to 15 and a half centimeters. Oh, I didn't mean to throw it away. Better say centimeter, not rotations. And then I'm going to have it make a right turn to face the house. And face the box, I should say, where the cat is. Well, I can just type 100 and it's misbehaving. It turns out that you can type right into this box if you don't want to use the graphic. And I want to say a half rotation so that it's about 90 degrees. So now we're saying go forward 11 centimeters, make that first right turn, go forward 72 centimeters, make a left turn, go forward 15 and a half centimeters, make a right turn. With a little luck, we'll be facing where the cat is. I just downloaded it into the robot. Stop the share. It's lined up where I think I want it. Let me double check here, see if it's fairly straight. Push the green button. It's not actually following the road. It's using dead reckoning, trying to go straight, fairly straight. Oh, kind of ran into that. Uh, so I can make an adjustment there, but it got pretty close. Let me move this back. I, uh, this is an old print of the map. The new map has got the uh, house in a better place. I think I'll increase that. We'll go back to the program. 
Well, first, I'm going to show you something on this robot on the webcam. There's a third motor here. Oh, that's not too good. I'm going to turn this off to get rid of the glare. Here's a third motor. It's actually bigger than the, the motors that are driving the wheels, but same general technology. This is the main uh, axle part, but it goes all the way through the motor and there's another part of the axle at the top here. Uh, and there's a little tiny black gear that's got a special rounded shape so that you can hook it up to another gear that's at right angles. So when the, this motor rotates this way, it lifts this arm up and down. Um, so that and it's a lot easier if you were holding this robot and plugging in the gears yourself, but there's a pair of gears. It's not changing the speed. It's just changing the uh, axis of rotation from this direction to this direction uh, using a pair of little gears. So I'm gonna now add uh, a little programming uh, to this third motor, and I'm going to use a blue block because I'm not driving anymore. I'm using a separate motor. I look underneath here. Uh, it, it, this direction clockwise will lift, and this direction counterclockwise will, will drop. So I'm interested in dropping this arm um, by about a quarter of a rotation of this axle counterclockwise. So I went over that a little fast, but I'll, I'll go ahead and do it and we can talk some more about that. Hey, hey, Bruce, we have a question in chat. I'm yeah. not sure if you got to it. Um, someone is curious to know if there is an upper limit on how many versions of the code can be saved. Do you mean on the robot? I'm assuming on the robot. Do you mean the download into a particular slot? Yes, correct. Um, it, as far as I know, it replaces uh the uh, the code each time the graphical blocks that you see on the screen are not what goes into the robot it converts it into what computer science call uh pseudocode and then there's a little uh, uh master program the firmware program uh, uh executes the pseudocode so each time you download it, it it copies the newest version of that pseudocode into slot zero this because this is a pretty recent kit it's got plenty of memory uh, it's limited to 20 program numbers, but each of those programs can be uh, fairly complicated, probably a lot more complicated than your kids will do in the first season. Um, usually the complexity of the, of the program, somewhat limited by the size of the screen, but there's a technique um, which we'll probably won't get to in the second session called My Blocks, where you can create little programs that are then used by the master program and that allows you to get create more complicated, sophisticated programs without uh, um, exceeding both the screen size and the, and the human capacity to understand. It's an advanced concept called modularity. I'm, I'm answering more questions than you ask, but uh, uh, it's a pretty flexible situation here. The one thing you can't do is if you store a program on, on the brick, the hub, and then your computer crashes and you wanna get the program back off the hub. Sorry, there's no way of converting that pseudocode on the hub back into the graphical program. The kids are gonna to have to remember what they did if you crashed the program, or crashed the computer or uh, made a big mistake in the program. There is a way that I can point you to for making backup copies of the programs on the computer. You could put on uh, a USB stick, you could put, um, uh, on a Google Drive or uh, somewhere else on the same computer or whatever, backing up is a, 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 a best practice because things go wrong and you don't want to have to start over halfway through the season. But now I'm answering more questions that you didn't really ask. So uh, I'll take more questions on that and other things as we get into it. Yeah, um, this, is, this is great. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, okay, so what did we just do? Um, I said I wanted to call set arm to go down, so I need to drop, I need to go back to share screen to add more code. So I'm gonna drag this up to give me some room on the screen. Oh, my share screen thing is getting away. You can't see that, but I can. I'm gonna move that over here. Okay, up, up, up. I'm gonna use a blue block now. 
Turns out that that motor is connected to E, if I remember correctly. Yep. Um, so I'm going to use this block, um, but I need to tell it it's E. Yep. Um, move this up some more so I can see that. So the motor I want to actuate or turn on, and I decided I wanted it to go counterclockwise um, in order to lower the arm. I hopefully I figured that out correctly. If I didn't, I'll, ha I'll have a bug. And I estimated that dropping that arm is about a quarter of rotation of that axle. So this is a final step. Now that it's driven to about where the cat is, going to try to drop the arm and capture the cat. It's not going to get it quite right, but we might be close. Any questions about what why I battered a blue block and, and what this particular block says? Okay, let's put it in the robot. Got a little cursor problem here, bear with me. I don't know why it's not clicking. That works, it changes to two, but when I click on the down, it doesn't do anything. Oh, it lost its connection. Remember the green check mark? It's gone away, I don't know why, but we're gonna have to get it back. So I'm gonna click on the connect again. I'm going to tell it it's still a green light, and I'm going to push the blue button again. And I'm going to click on connect. It's going to go reconnect. And now the green check is back. Okay, so I don't know why that happened, but that'll happen to you probably or, or your kids. And, and now you know what hint to give them to get the thing to behave itself. It's not going to download if it can't talk to, if the Wi-Fi is not connected. Now, if I click on this, it does download it. You saw that little animation on the right. It's now this new and improved program is on the robot. So if I drop to screen share, you should see it big on the screen. It's lined up pretty well. Not to move it a little bit forward and tell it to go. I need to start program one. Okay, good shot. It didn't quite get it. So I'm going to add another couple of centimeters to one of those moves and see if I can get closer. Questions about what it just did and why? While I was doing that, I remembered why it lost Bluetooth. Um, I picked it up and I wanted to show you this motor and these lights from in. Uh, uh, causing glare, I turned the robot off. So of course it lost Bluetooth. I turned the robot was all the way off. Uh, so I'm gonna uh, keep the glare now and I'm gonna leave the robot on so I don't have to do that again. You put it back in the start position. I'm gonna take this back to the top. And I'm going to add a little distance to the program. So I need to screen share so you can see me do that. And it's this distance here that I, I thought I measured at 15 and a half, but I'm going to say maybe 17 and a half is better. Not, I should be able to download now because it's still got the Bluetooth connection and the green check mark. Okay, it's downloaded. If I drop to share, you'll be able to see it bigger on your screen. And I'll push the green button. Okay, so if I 
If I made another adjustment, I'd probably be a little, a little closer. But you notice that when it went down the, the black road, it didn't stay centered. Um, that's for two reasons. One is a slight error in the way I start things here, just to, you know a few degrees off. When it makes that turn, even if the turn is 90 degrees, if it's a few degrees off in this direction, by the time it gets down here, it's several centimeters off of center. Um, so how do you control that? Well, I could have some kind of jig that I can make to try to get a, a more precise starting angle. But it, even if I did that, uh, the tolerances of these motors, these are not professional grade uh, motors for milling lumber or whatever uh, the professionals use uh, robotics for. Uh, these are very sophisticated toys. Um, and it's going to vary every time I go down this road, it's going to be a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, in a somewhat random, unpredictable pattern. Um, if the kids score points one out of five times, that's going to be better than none, but it can be pretty frustrating on game day if, if in the three rounds uh, uh, at the tournament, it doesn't score those points any of those three times because of that lack of precision. So what do we do about that? Well, we got some opportunities. One is, this is very high contrast, black against white. We've got two light sensors that can detect that edge, uh, which is if you point right at the edge, it's not going to be somewhere between black and white. If it's over here, it's going to be white. Over here, it's going to be black. Likewise, the left edge. So we have the opportunity, instead of using dead reckoning to go down this road, um, to use uh, the light sensor to track that edge. We've got another opportunity down here when we go to make this turn. Um, it may be at a slight angle, but if it was at the correct turn here and it knew what that was, it could use the gyro sensor makes this turn to come back into alignment with the original direction that was down here. That's a lot of words that I can demonstrate a little bit tonight and a more next time. So the gyro can give us more precise turns. The light sensor can give us a uh, much more reliable running down the road. Um, there's a couple other techniques. Don't think we'll get to it even next week, but we might. You could potentially use a light sensor to count these red squares uh, to measure distance, maybe per more precisely than the centimeters that we measured earlier. Why are we doing all this? In the competition format, we're doing it to get more points, or the kids are. Uh, when we're thinking about teaching, learning, and uh, building skills, uh, understanding how sensors work, how control works, uh, how gyros work, what angles are, uh, is all uh, STEM learning that uh, could go well beyond uh, how many points you get in a competition. So with that said, Let's try one of those ideas. I'm gonna go back to screen share. During the competition, Bruce, um, yeah. do the judges look at the code at all or are they basing um, everything on just how the robot performs? Great question. Um, uh, I err on the side of giving a little bit too much information, but not, every, not the whole story. Um, at the competition, the people that are watching the tables and, and enforcing, there are some rules the kids uh, need to know about and are, are enforced just like in a basketball game. Those are called referees. And they're also effectively the scorekeepers because um, it's not as simple as, as uh, dropping into a basket. They, they have to observe what the robot does uh, in order to uh, score the various missions. So the uh, the referees are also filling out score sheets, typically on a, on a computer pad rather than on paper. Uh, in parallel with all of that at our tournaments, the kids are scheduled not only three times in the gymnasium or the auditorium, but one time in a classroom where approximately three judges are interviewing them. 
They'll hear their what's called the innovation presentation, which uh, we, we haven't talked about tonight, but I can take questions at the end or next time. Uh, they will hear, uh, they will get, uh, they will make a presentation, get questions on that. Usually the second thing that uh, occurs in that judging room is the judges say, tell us about your robot. What missions did you do? Um, uh, what did you do to program to get that mission to work reliably? Um, can you show us a copy of your program? Sometimes the kids will say, no, I don't have it with me, but um, I recommend, and I, it may be somewhere in the competition instructions, to print the programs out, um, that is the kids to print them out and then uh, have them available to show the judge. So when the judge says, what did you do? Then instead of waving their hands and saying, I used the pink block, they can show them the actual program. Uh, the judges may not know quite as much as the kids at that point about this particular language because they may be well, professional programmers, but they'll probably understand what the kids are saying and be able to understand whether the kids understand their own programs. Does that answer part of your question? Yes, that does. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So I'm going to do one of the uh, things that I mentioned that I might do. See if I can make this smaller enough to get on the screen. No. There it is. I disconnected it. Okay. Get it up here. And this left turn here, I'm going to try to make that more precise. Okay. And I'm going to baffle you with some code and then uh, we'll run out of time and I'll explain it more next time. I'm going to set this left turn aside, which I said is approximately 90 degrees. And I'm going to try to program something that's much closer to 90 degrees for reliability. So I'm going to tell it that I want to use a control block, which we I have PowerPoint slides, but uh, I'll just demonstrate it this time. And I'm going to say, wait. The wait, as I said on a slide earlier, is very similar to the repeat block, except I have nothing for it to do while it's repeating. So I'm going to use the shorthand wait. Um, and I need to tell it how long I want it to wait. And I happen to know that there's a blue sensor block that uses the gyro, which is down here. And it looks like the block I want says pitch on it, but what the heck does pitch mean? Pitch is uh, lifting the nose up and down like an airplane might uh, pitch up to climb, pitch down to descend. Uh, roll is is to roll the the wings of a plane uh, left and right to to roll. That roll also occurs in sailboats when they heel over. Yaw is the technical term for turning left and right. So the one that we're almost always going to want to use is yaw. Um, so I'm I change that to yaw. You're going to have to maybe give the kids a hint that they're looking for yaw. It's hidden under pitch. Um, this. Oval means it's a particular value, an angle. You can see the word angle there. But if I try to plug that in here, it doesn't fit. That's bad syntax to use a computer science word. This um, hexagon is referring to a, a true false value. To do that, I need to go over and look for operators to produce true false. And one of them is um, the less end block. If I put the yaw value in here, turns out that a left, a change in yaw to the left is a negative number. So when you first introduce to the kids, probably try for right hand because they're more comfortable with positive numbers. But I'm going to assume for the moment you're uh, you remember your negative numbers, and I could change this to an equal uh, equal ninety, but there's a good programming practice that says. When you're using a sensor, never use equal. Instead, use either less than or greater than for reasons I'll, I'll explain. If I say I'm looking for a yaw angle less than 89, that's a left turn 90 degrees, 90 or more. Anything less than 89 might be minus 90, minus 91, minus 92. If I said equal and it was actually minus 91, it would just keep going. It's not equal. 
But if I say less than 89, any value 90, minus 90, minus 91, whatever, will stop this implicit loop. It'll stop, the program will stop waiting and go to the next step. So what is it doing? What is it waiting for? I need to give it something to do. So I'm going to go back to my pink blocks. And instead of telling it to move for a particular amount, I'm going to say start moving. And I'm going to use this start moving block. And I'm going to have it turn in place to the left, like it did before. But it's going to keep turning left until I tell it to stop moving. So I'm going to put the stop after the wait. So this is three steps, more complicated than before, but should be much more precise. Start a hard left turn in place. Um, have the program wait while the robot continues to turn, monitoring the yaw angle until the yaw angle becomes less than 89. Again, the, a right-hand turn would be a little easier. You'd be looking for greater than positive 89 for a right-hand turn. Should have shown that you first. Uh, I'll do that next time. And now I don't need this block anymore because I don't need to approximate the left turn with this block. So I plug these back in. So that left turn should be more predictable. What is the yaw angle of zero? All of these things being equal, it'll be whatever the robot, wherever the robot was pointing when we turned it on. But I've long since forgotten which direction it was pointing when I turned it on. So I need one more block buried in uh, the sensor blocks is a block called set yaw angle to zero. And I'm going to put it right uh, here. And sometimes you have to add a little weight after that, but I think this might be OK. This says, uh, until I tell you otherwise, uh, zero is the direction you're pointing before Oops, no, that's the wrong place before we start the turn. So I want it to be right up here. Zero is the angle before we start the turn. Now start turning left. Now have the program wait until the yaw angle decreases to less than minus 89, then stop moving and then go forward. I'm doing this a little fast because we're two minutes before the end. I want to give you one last demo. It may not work. I may have a bug, but we'll at least have a partial solution here. That's now downloaded. If I drop the screen share, I need to put the robot back in the start position with its arms up. Line the sensors up the way I had it before. And push go. Now it's still off a little bit. We haven't fixed that problem. It's tracking off. But when it gets down here, it'll make a, a very precise 90 degree turn. Still off. So we got some more work to do to get this precise. Next time we'll talk about line following that black line. Uh, there's another way to make that, that last left turn more precise. We'll program the right turn using uh, the same tech, the yaw technique to get that first turn to be more reliable. We may not rescue the cat, but we're gonna get closer and closer to a, uh, a solution that should work, not all the time, but most of the time. I'll drop the screen share. No, I've already dropped the screen share. I will drop the spotlight so I can see more of you. Uh, so that your uh, program says start colon 100. It starts uh, moving, turning uh, to the left. And correct. then the, the other, the next uh, line evaluates that, that yaw. Right. Um, um, so it won't complete complete the 100 degree turn. It would just start it. Oh, thanks for asking. The numbers get confusing very quickly. Uh, the, the 100 is a weird way of, of saying percentage. Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. 100%. That's right. 100% turn just means turn is, is uh, in place. If I wanted, if I changed this block here from 100, um, to a gradual turn of let's say minus 40, it will gradually turn, but it'll still monitor the yaw and it'll gradually turn until the robot is completed 90 degrees. It'll take many inches because it's not turning in place, um, but it will stop after uh, the yaw value in the built-in 
gyro sensor detects less than minus 89. I might as well do that uh, and then we'll, uh, I'll let you all go and, um, and stay for any last minute questions. I mean, it won't, uh, it won't get where we want it because the gradual turn will be pretty weird, but it'll be fun. I need to uh, drop the share so you can see it and spotlight that. And bye. Okay, now I'm gonna go. Going down field, it's off a little bit, not too far. Now it's gonna start that left turn. There's a gradual turn, but it stops the turn after it gets 90 degrees. You see, it didn't get nearly as close because that was a soft left turn, but the left turn was 90 degrees. That help a little bit? Yes, that makes sense now. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna let um, everybody go except for somebody that has a last question. And then I'm hoping you all come back a week from now for more, I hope it's, it's somewhat enjoyable and somewhat informative. But uh, as I said, uh, I wish all, all or, mo or most of you a good evening and take a couple more questions for the stragglers. Just to make it less formal, I'm gonna navigate to the stop recording uh, to take us all off the record, so to speak.